going to 30 study session, SS-1, Groundwater Sustainability Act. Mrs. Spears. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This evening we have Julianne Phillips. She is the Water and Natural Resources Director for Kings County. She's here this evening to give us a brief overview of SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and how that is going to affect the citizens of Lamar. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, Hate to repeat Michelle, but I'm Julianne Phillips. I'm with the Kings County. I'm the Division of Water and Natural Resources Director. I really appreciate you having me here this evening for an overview of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. We have a running joke in water that unless there's an acronym for something, it must not be all that important. <laughs> so a few of the ones that I'll be using quite a bit this evening, uh, Sigma. SGMA, that stands for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014. GSA, that's a groundwater sustainability agency. And GSP, which is your groundwater sustainability plan. A brief overview about what SIGMA is. This is referred to as landmark legislation. It's the first time that the state of California passed legislation to regulate the extraction of groundwater. The, this was a package of three bills that was passed and signed into law in 2014. And what the legislation does is it allows local agencies to form groundwater sustainability agencies. And then those groundwater sustainability agencies are tasked with developing groundwater sustainability plans. The GSAs also have to tackle the undesirable results. So the GSP has to address how we're going to how we're going to manage groundwater in a way that avoids those undesirable results. And high priority groundwater sustainability plans are due in January of 2020, and then your medium priority basins are due in 2022. So we use the word sustainability a lot. It, appears both in the GSA and the GSP. So what does the state mean when they say you guys have to manage your basins sustainably? The way that the state has defined it is that sustainable groundwater management is the management and use of groundwater in a manner that can be maintained during the planning and implementation horizon without causing undesirable results. So basically the main takeaway of this is managing groundwater and avoiding undesirable results. Question. Yes, sir. What's the definition of undesirable? <laughs> We're getting there. Oh, okay. We are getting there. <laughs> That's a great question. Because that is the next slide. What are undesirable results? What, what do we mean by avoiding an undesirable result? We have six of them in Sigma. We sometimes refer to them as the six deadly sins. There are lowering of groundwater levels, seawater intrusion, reduction of storage, degraded quality, subsidence, and surface water depletion, where your groundwater and your streams are interconnected. So we, to, what is an undesirable result? Well, it's anything that has a significant and unreasonable impact on any one of those six. So that's another vague term, right? What is yeah. significant and unreasonable? Mm -hmm. And actually, um, I have later in the presentation the chapters of the groundwater sustainability plan and those two are addressed specifically in the minimum thresholds chapter of the GSP which is how much reduction can we have how much subsidence can we bear before we have to implement specific management actions in those areas some are really important in our area such as lowering of groundwater levels and subsidence and some don't apply at all, such as seawater intrusion, and others apply very minimally, and that is the surface water depletion. That only applies in very specific areas near streams. This looks, I would, I would like to tell you it looks a lot better in front of you, but it's a pretty small slide in front of you too, so I'm not sure that that is true. But this is, um, I stole this from the Department of Water Resources, and this was developed in 2015. This is our groundwater legislation timeline. Each one of those boxes is, is significant because it represents a milestone that the local agencies have to hit 
to maintain local control. So each one of those boxes are essentially a pinch point for local agencies to make sure that they have achieved the goal by that date that's defined so that the state doesn't come in and declare the basin probationary. We have a big arrow that says where we are. So we've accomplished a lot. Everything we've done so far is really related to uh, bringing together the groundwater sustainability agencies and making sure that all of our documentation, our boundaries, our government, our governance structure is set up and sent to DWR. And then everything to the right of the arrow is in the future. And those are our groundwater sustainability plan markers. As you can see, there is sort of a little dead space where that arrow is. And those two years between 2018 and 2020, those are GSP development years. So it it's, looks like it's gonna start getting very busy very quickly. And that's true because groundwater sustainability plans have just been published. Are those dates set by some authority or? Yeah, they are set actually in the legislation itself. So it gives um, the milestone of January 31st, 2020 to furnish a GSP to the state. If you don't, then a, fur then a further action by that is say, is the state's ability to come in and declare you probationary because there's no GSP that the basin's being managed under. And then the DWR has two years to review the plan for its sufficiency. And we, we think that's gonna be an iterative process. The department's technical team is gonna have a lot of questions. Our technical team is gonna to have to come up with a lot of answers and that's gonna be back and forth. And at the, at the end of two years, it's not sufficient. Then uh, that opens another door for the state to come in. And so, yeah, they, will, they were all set in the legislation. Would that be in 2022, June, 2022? I believe June, 2022 on that box is the, um, I want to say that the June 2022 deadline in that box is the deadline for um, our medium priority basins. I can't particularly tell here, but I think that this okay. applies specifically okay. to a high priority. Right. I, I've used the word um, basin a lot. So what is that and who determines what the basin is? The Department of Water Resources publishes a document called Bulletin 118, and they do, they do periodic updates to the plan. They also did an interim update that was Sigma specific in 2016. What's significant about the update process is that's the opportunity to apply for a basin boundary modification. And those modifications can be scientific. So you have local monitoring that skews things a little bit differently. You can work with the department on modifying that boundary. But what was most common were the jurisdictional boundary adjustments because groundwater doesn't particularly pay any attention to the, the jurisdictions above it. It just goes where it goes. So a lot for, in some basins for management ease, they requested jurisdictional um, boundary updates. And these are pretty significant because these determine, the department is going to evaluate the sustainability of your groundwater sustainability plan on a basin wide level. So this is everybody that you have to play in the sandbox with. It defines all of the partners that you have to work with to achieve sustainability. What's also important about Bulletin 118 is that it prioritizes the subbasins. So we talked a little bit about high and medium priority subbasin, and this is where those um, classifications come from. The department weighs different <coughs> factors and there are some here that don't weigh so heavily in our subbasin. The population overlying the subbasin, projected growth, and um, their catch-all of anything that they determine to be relevant. But what really sets us apart as a high-priority subbasin are the ones that really do apply to our basin. Our number of public supply wells that draw from the basin. All of our municipalities and of our, our community service districts rely on groundwater with the exception of Kettleman City, whose drinking water treatment plant is coming online soon. We also have, you know, we are, we're a proud agricultural community. We have a lot of irrigated acreage and wells that overlie our basin. And we also have uh, documented impacts to groundwater, such as overdraft and subsidence that really weigh heavily on our basin. So we talked about what subbasins are. So where are we? Well, here in Lemoore, we are located in the Tulare Lake Subbasin. 
which um, this is an excerpt from Bulletin 118 that defines the critically overdrafted subbasins to Larry Lake um, is on there, which means that here we're on the expedited timeline for Sigma compliance. Now we do have different types of basins, right? There are different types of basins or is this one sub basin? It's just one sub basin. Um, when I when I do this presentation on the, the county scale, we overlie four different sub basins, but Lamore only overlies one. Oh, Lamore, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My pleasure. So this is a map of the Tulare Lake sub basin. The Tulare Lake sub basin does have um, regulatory coverage over the entire sub basin, and it has been divided up between five different groundwater sustainability agencies the Mid Kings River Groundwater Sustainability Agency, Southwest Kings, El Rico, Tri County, and then most importantly here, the South Fork Kings GSA. And what is unique, um, as opposed to our, our neighboring subbasins, is that the Tulare Lake subbasin is working co collectively on one groundwater sustainability plan. So the city of Lemoore is entirely within the South Fork Kings GSA, and these are the esteemed board members of the South Fork Kings GSA, your very own council member, uh, Mr. Brown. We also have Supervisor Neves, and then we also have representatives of Empire Westside Irrigation, Stratford Irrigation, and Stratford Public Utilities District as well. The Tulare Lake Subbasin GSP, uh, it, like I said, our GSP, we are due, it is due to the state on January 31st of 2020. Included in our Tulare Lake Basin GSP, some really interesting and specific chapters because this is really where the impacts of what groundwater management are going to have in this area. We have chapters on the sustainable yield and the water budget. Yes, sir. Yes, I just, I don't mean to hold you. Um, oh, no worries. With the, with the basins, um, you said that it's on one type of basin. Is it true that we can create a, our own basin, make basins here, water basins here? We wouldn't be able to do that without getting um, a basin boundary modification from the state. But they have been done, basins. But they have been done. Okay. Um, but I, I haven't seen, usually it's just a very small adjustment of one line. They haven't really carved out entire separate sub basins. To recharge basins, what I'm trying to oh, get at. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I thought you were talking about a sub basin. Yeah, okay. recharge basins, um, That those are in the project and management actions area of the GSP and they are very, that is probably one of the most important um, areas to focus on because in Sigma, you only have two knobs to turn to reach sustainability. You have your demand side knobs, so you can reach sustainability simply by reducing demand, which here would mean significant fouling. Or you can turn the knob to the right by augmenting your water supply. And that means taking the opportunity in wet years to capture flood flows and extra water, storing it here, putting it in our aquifer to get us through the dry years without mm -hmm. reaching our minimum thresholds. That's what I was getting at. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. So, Included in our Tulare Lake GSP, we have our sustainable yield and water budget. Um, this is probably going to be the most scary to people because they're going to look at the overall sub-basin wide water budget and start thinking, well, on a pro rata scale, if I have this many acres, this is my sustainable yield. But that's not how the Tulare Lake Basin is going to be implementing the GSP. We're looking for a softer landing than simply giving an allocation to everybody. We're going to be looking at doing more projects rather than simply ratcheting people down to a sustainable yield that they can't work with immediately. We also discuss minimum thresholds. Those are important. That's how far can we keep drawing down our groundwater? How much subsidence can we bear before we have to start, you know, making some <laughs> making some adjustments in those areas so that we don't, you know, it's like hitting a it's like hitting deadpan. You don't ever want to get there. So it establishes those. We also have our projects and management actions. So the management actions, those are the demand side actions. Those are how we're going to implement, you know, things like fouling programs. And then we also have the projects, which are supply side actions. And then there's also a monitoring network. And this is going to be the most immediate uh, 
thing that people see come out of the GSP because this is going to be what has to be accomplished first. You know, we this gives us the important information that we need to establish our projects to can evaluate how effective they are. This is an excerpt from our GSP. These are the South Fork Kings GSA management actions. And what you can what you can see here is that they're pretty evenly split on how they're going to reach sustainability. It's about 50-50 your supply side and your demand side actions. And included in the, the supply side actions are possible partnerships with neighboring GSAs uh, to reduce capital costs to invest in things like recharge basins. And then what's even more unique to this area for groundwater recharge purposes is capitalizing on really innovative projects that have been done by neighboring irrigation districts called um, ASR wells, or aquifer storage and recovery wells. You can use existing wells that you have to recharge groundwater. So what's next with our GSP process? Well, the notice was sent to all of the land use agencies on September 3rd, and we were given copies of the draft GSP on September 6th. The closure of the 90-day comment period or review period is going to be December 2nd, and we're holding that public meeting at the county, um, not in our board chambers, but in our room right adjacent to it, if you'd like to attend and provide comments. And the GSA boards will be adopting the GSPs in early to mid-January so that the consultants have enough time to upload it before the January 31st deadline. And then interestingly enough, our first annual report, they're gonna wanna know a whole year of what we've done three months later in April. We also, the Subbasin is working on outreach efforts. There will be two meetings, one at the Lakeside Community Church in Hanford uh, to go over the GSP, and then one here in Lemoore as well on October 15th um, that the consultants are putting on as well. And also individual GSAs are also doing their outreach efforts. I believe the one here in Lemoore is being coordinated with South Fort Kings, but they also have an interested parties list and a mailing list if you'd like to be more involved. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. You were saying that uh... ASR wells, they're going to be, re they can recharge the lands, mm -hmm. fields. How is that so? How do they do that? How if, is it ran? Well, you, if you have a well, basically what you have is a big straw in the ground. And so ASR wells are, you're taking that and you're injecting water and you're pressurizing it and you're putting it down. With that, you do have some water treatment questions. Um, those who have come before us are working those out so that we'll know exactly what to do when, when we start implementing them, but it is a really unique and innovative way that's a lot more cost effective than recharge basins. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. On those two outreach meetings, you had locations and dates, but did you have a time on yeah, those? Yeah, no time uh, on it. They are both at 5.30 p.m. 5.30 p.m., thank yes. you, ma'am. How about reclaimed water like <clears throat> I guess it's referred to as like purple pipe water. Uh, when we're through purifying it as much as we can and we send it, say, to the golf course for irrigation, is that part of a solution? It has not been included in the GSP, but I'm sure Nathan can speak a lot more intelligently about the water treatment plans that you guys here that you guys have here in the city of Lemoore, um, because they are pretty pretty tremendous, and there is a lot of opportunity there as far as like state funding and things like that to um, continue to improve those projects. But you guys are are well ahead of the curve on those. That's all I have. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to thank Mr. Brown, who's dedicated a lot of his, his time and energy to the South Fork Kings GSA. Thank you. Thank you for your service. I see I got a public comment. Tom Reed, 1060, pardon me more. I have a question. Is every county and city in the state of California required to do this? Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, it depends. 
there are some areas of the state where they're either low priority basins or they've been adjudicated, so they're not subject to Sigma, but every high and medium priority basin in the state is subject to it. Yeah, Rogers, Dine, five one Tranquility Court. Uh, I guess when we talk about water, I guess the one big number one control is up here. They control how much water falls out of the heavens and how much we get out of the mouths and stuff. So that control is kind of tough on all of us trying to do a math equation for that. But my question to her would be is how much water are we consuming in this Kings County versus you and I and household or businesses versus farmland? How many, who's eating the groundwater up? Us, you know, or that. And are they a plan somewhere down the road, like in medical, that's a tourniquet, last resort? Is there a moratorium in this plan that where you stop construction, just like Morrill Bay? You don't build a new house or get a permit unless somebody tears their house down. So I don't know. Okay. I don't want to see that. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? See, there's none. Um, we're going to go into closed session. One liability claim, government code section 54956.95. Mr. Mark Oliver Stack, represented by the law office of Darrell and B. Freeman Industries. Agency claim, agency against City of Lamore. Liability claim, government code section 54956.95 mr rodilla villa agency's claim against city of lamore three liability claim government code section 54956.95 mr dallas jewel agency claim against city of lamore four conference with real property negotiators government code section 54956.8 Property APN 024 slash 080 slash 068 and APN 024 slash 080 slash 070. Agency negotiator Nathan Olson, city manager, negotiating parties, Figra LLC under negotiations price and terms. Time is now 5.55. Adjourn. Council Chambers, 429 C Street. The month is October 1st, 2019. It's now 730. Uh, we're going to have the invocation. As we have the invocation, I want you guys to remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor Kim Nelson. Father God, we come before you, Lord Jesus, and we, we come with humbled hearts, Lord God. Father God, I thank you that we live in a city where we begin our meetings with prayer. I thank you, Father God, that we have leaders, Lord God, that would bow their heads before you and seek your face. I thank you, Father God, for the citizens of this city, Father God, that would want you to guide us and our police and, and our fire and our ambulances, Father God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the people that you have put in this place. Father God, I ask for your guidance. I ask for your wisdom. I ask you, Lord, to lead, Father God, our leaders. And I, I pray for those behind me, Lord God, as each one wants to articulate their heart. I pray, Father God, that you, Lord Jesus, would guide each one according to your will and your purpose. I ask for your blessing upon this meeting. I ask you, Father God, to protect us, to protect our leaders, to protect our citizens. Father God, Lord Jesus, we can do nothing without you. We can't even stand here unless you allowed it. Father God, I thank you for this great city. I thank you, Lord God, for your hand that is resting upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Be seated. Thank you. Roll call. Ms. Marissa. Good evening. 
evening. Council Member Brown? Here. Council Member Lyons? Here. Council Member Scaldi? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Plord? Here. Mayor Neal? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, agenda approval, additions, and or deletions, are there any? I see there's none. Going on to public comment. Closed session report. Okay, we don't give a uh, closed session report. Excuse me. Go ahead, attorney. Um, so, Mayor and Council, there's nothing to report at this time. Thank you. Now go back to public comment. Amy Ward. What a surprise. All right. Um, I just wanted to update the council real quick. Our last Rock in the Arbor of 2019 is this Friday, 6.30 p.m. out at the Arbor. We will have the band August. I'm very excited to announce that this will be a salute to the military. We have about 26 different vendors coming out, uh, lots of food vendors that haven't been out before. Um, so it's going to be a really great time. Again, the band August will be performing 6.30 out at the Arbor. So we hope to see you guys there. Awesome. Melanie? Is there a Melanie? She's here for a different item. Okay, you're for, you're for a different right. item. And so okay. is this person. And so is this person, okay. So just ask if there's any other public comment. Any other public comment? Absolutely, you can come up and expound on that right now. State your name and address. Yes. As as long as it's not an item already on the agenda. As long as it's not on the okay. agenda, you can speak, she speak didn't on have it. A she copy didn't have a copy of the agenda. Okay. That's all. Okay, that's it then. I see there's none. Hold on. She's, Hold on, she's looking at the agenda to see if she has a comment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Everything good? Okay, thank you. I see there's no more public comment. I'm going on the ceremony and presentations. I see there's no ceremony and presentations. Department and City Manager Report. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. We'll start out tonight's reports with Chief Daryl Smith. Good evening, Council Members. Um, first thing to report, uh, last Friday, I got to experience the Public Safety Appreciation Luncheon. And I say experience because I have to tell you, last week, I was the envy of all my colleagues in Kings County. Um, as you know, in the past, the luncheon has been sponsored by the Hanford Chamber of Commerce. This year, the luncheon was at risk of going away and our Chamber of Commerce and Lemoore stepped up and took on that uh, project. And I have to tell you that it was a, it was a full house, a sellout. And I'd like to say that uh, Amy Ward, she did a phenomenal job. And, and I wish I could recognize all your staff, uh, Amy, and, I, and I hopefully you do that for me. But um, I got to tell you, it was the best event ever. Um, I also want to point out that uh, uh, many of our tickets were sponsored by community members. Uh, Mr. Rogers bought a whole table for first responders for Lemoore PD and fire. Um, Francis uh, Perry at Best Western Lemoore bought a whole table. So we felt very blessed in the first responder uh, world in Kings County last week as a result of all the hard work that the Lemoore Chamber did. So big shout out to Amy and all her crew. And I think she... Next thing, uh, as you know, I'll start out with a story first. So 30 years ago, I went to the Tulare Kings Police Academy and I graduated academy and I got an opportunity to go to work with the Hanford Police Department. And I remember getting a background investigation and I was, I was shocked that I passed the background, first of all. <laughs> and then secondly, I uh, had to show up for this thing called psychological evaluation. So it's, uh, it's a series of two written tests with 400 plus questions. That don't make any sense, by the way. And I took that test, and I remember going home and telling my wife, I told her, you know, I took this test, and they're going to determine if I'm fit for police officer work. And she goes, how do you feel? I go, terrible. I go, but one thing, if I pass that test, I'm going to retire at Hanford PD because I don't ever want to take that test again. 
So fast forward 24 years, November 2013, and I got a call and I had an opportunity to come to my hometown at City of Lemoore to be the uh, acting police chief. And when I came to the community and came to the department, I had an opportunity to talk to every member of the police department, sworn and non-sworn. And I remember thinking um, initially it felt kind of like I was playing hooky because I was at Hanford for 24 years and it was it was awkward being away from there. I literally grew up there. And then after about a couple of weeks of talking to the personnel in Lemoore and seeing all of the, you know, the programs and the passion and the enthusiasm for community service, our volunteers in policing started in 1997. And just seeing, you know, people like that who are dedicated to actually making a difference in our community and me being part of that was something special. And then the community reaction to me coming home and, you know, being the police chief in my hometown, you know, it's been phenomenal. Um, our civic organizations, our school districts, you know, our businesses, our residents, they're second to none. And I say that having worked for another agency and they're second to none. I could tell you Lemoore is a special place. So I'd like to thank, you know, past and present council members, those who have supported me and continue to support public safety, law and fire. Thank you for your support. To the community, it's been an honor to serve you. And I hope to give back to the community in a different way after I'm no longer the police chief. Um, I start a new chapter. Next week, I have an opportunity to be more involved in the uh, police academy and have an impact on our future law enforcement uh, you know leaders one day so i just wanted to say thank you um, it's been 30 years and it's been the best career that uh, i highly recommend it for people um, i love my profession i love my job i can tell you that uh, we're in good shape the future is bright for law enforcement in our community we have some great leaders ready to lead and and when I leave, if I did my job correctly, everyone will forget about me. And that's what I hope happens. So thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Hey, Michelle Spear, next up. I can't, but thank you. <laughs> um, so as Chief Smith just mentioned, he is retiring us and leaving our agency. Um, I called him a quitter earlier, and that might have been unfair because he has put in 30 years of service. Um, we have an active recruitment for a replacement police chief. Those are going to be some very large shoes to fill. Um, but I wanted to let the public know and council know um, that we currently have a community survey that is going to be part of the next police chief recruitment. So if anybody is interested in filling out the survey, it's on our website at www.lamore.com, right there on the homepage in a blue banner. So if you're interested in providing your feedback on what the next police chief should focus on, that's where you will find it. Thank you. What will be the last day to submit that for the public? Currently, it's listed as October 4th, so okay. Friday. Thank you. Only about five questions. Season fill out. Ms. Spears? <laughs> uh, question. How are they hiring? Are they hiring outside the agency or is it in-house? How are you guys? We're doing an internal recruitment. Oh, so in-house. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Frank Rivera. Good evening, Council. Um, at the last Council meeting, I informed you of a water leak. Uh, it was a water lateral out here on Fox Street that was leaking. Uh, uh, the water division repaired that. And then one, one week later, uh, we had another leak to about pro approximately 50 feet east of that one. So uh, staff was hoping to wait till Monday to, to resolve the issue, but Sunday, uh, uh, they received calls of flooding in the area, so the uh, water division um, remedied the leak uh, uh, this Sunday. Also, uh, with all the, the water running in the canal, we've uh, actually, the, the water's has surfaced uh, inside of our underground canal system, uh, one on Mary Street, um, just uh, north of Spring Lane. Uh, sewer division went in there, excavated, and was able to repair the, uh, the problem from the top of the pipe. We uh, then 
uh, also, then we have another one on Beverly at the Beverly Apartments uh, that just uh, north of uh, Hanford Amona Road. A refuse truck was uh, picking up uh, uh, dumpsters and the rear wheel fell into a soft spot in the driveway. It turned out it was also a leaky uh, irrigation canal. So this one's going to be hard to fix. Uh, the canal company stopped running water uh, yesterday and we'll only have till Friday to get it repaired, which we probably won't have time to repair it entirely. We just hope to slow it down. So just want to inform you of that. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. And then just for me, um, community roundtable uh, this Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Um, it'll be at 7-Eleven West Cinnamon, and we currently have four people signed up for the community roundtable. So if you want to come hang out and have a nice chat, a little small quorum, um, it'll be this Thursday. Um, feel free to come on by. That's it. Are you providing lunch? No. 5.30. <laughs> Water. <laughs> Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Going well, moving on down to section three, consent calendar. 3-1, approval minutes, regular meeting, September 17, 2019. 3-2, approval adoption of resolution 2019-40, authorizing the application of the receipt of SB2 planning grant program funds. 3-3, approval denial and claims for Mr. Dallas Jorles. 3-4, approval denial of claims for Mr. Mark Stacks. 3-5, approval denial for claims for Mrs. Rodali Villa. 3-6, approval adoption of resolution 2019-41, establishing Lozano Smith in the city law firm of record. Do you, the council want to expound on this? I make a motion to approve consent calendar as presented. I'll second. I got a motion by Mr. Brown and a second by Mr. Scotty. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Scotty? Aye. Mr. Lyons? Aye. Mr. Blewett? Aye. And I vote aye. Motion for carries. Okay, move along. That's where you're going to accuse yourself. Tell you what, guys, I'm going to uh, accuse myself from this because I, I didn't vote on the dispensaries. Uh, so I'm going to stay my um, abstain for this and go in the back. So I'm going to go ahead and let the vice mayor come up there. <coughs> Take it from here. Mm -hmm. Public hearing, 4-1, public hearing resolution 2019-32, amending the master fee schedule, master user fee schedule ahead cannabis fee associated with permit and applications, SPEAR. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. So in order for the city to collect fees um, from citizens or people wishing to do business in the city, we must adopt a master user fee schedule. In June of 2017, the city adopted a master user fee schedule for the services that we provided at the time. Um, and as you know, we didn't have any cannabis businesses at that time. Um, so now resolution 2019-37 that is before you this evening is before you for adoption and approval in order to establish fees associated with cannabis businesses in town. So I just wanna go through a brief presentation and then I'll open it up to questions. So California state law authorizes local governments to set fees based on the cost of service as long as they are defensible. Well, you've already established a master user fee schedule for all of the services that we provide with the exception of cannabis. This particular um, spreadsheet or table is what our proposed fees will be. We have our ordinance, our current cannabis ordinance, it, uh, um, mentions four separate fees. It's the application fee, it's the employee permit fee, an employee renewal fee, and a regulatory permit fee. 
So you'll see that we are proposing a fee of $400 for an application, $175 for an employee permit fee that's on their initial application. And the ordinance requires that an employee receive a permit annually. Um, it's cheaper the second time around because you don't actually have to vet the application at the same level. They're just redoing their fingerprints and things like that. And then the cannabis regulatory permit fee is the fee that we charge or hope to charge to businesses operating cannabis businesses in the city limits and that is what we believe it will cost us to do continued regulation on those businesses to make sure that they're compliant with the state the city ordinances sorry the font looks so much bigger on my computer in the office <laughs> um <laughs> so the application fee of 400 dollars includes staff time for review and processing of an application we have done a few of these applications already um, and they take approximately six to eight hours to review set up background meetings etc um, the average hourly rate of the staff associated with the service is 57.50 an hour so we've come up with a fee of 400 dollars employee permit fees 175 same concept staff time to review and process the application anywhere from two and a half to three and a half hours and that includes the time to schedule them for fingerprints etc same 57.50 an hour um, again and a hundred dollar annual renewal fee so the regulatory permit fee is the big ticket item on the agenda this evening and that one is the um, based on the annual loaded salary so that's salary and benefits for all of the members of the city staff that have to touch that process in order for that regulatory permit fee to be issued as well as the people that are going to be associated with making sure that they stay compliant with our local ordinances so you have a city manager police commander community development director fire inspector, executive assistant to the police department, a community services officer, records supervisor and technicians, those are the record staff that process the fingerprinting and things of that nature, and then the city attorney's review of the um, development agreements and making sure that if we have questions along the way, they're there to assist us. So when you add all of that together, based on the percent that we've allocated, we think they will spend their time, we've made the assumption that we're gonna issue 10 regulatory permits. That's just an assumption. We don't really know, but that's a good gauge based on the level of interest we've had up to this point. So we believe it's gonna cost us approximately $128,640 to process the permits for those individuals. Um, divide that by 10 and we get $12,860 per permit. Now this can change in the future. You reserve the right for the resolution attached to update those fees annually. So at such time, if the city needed to employ other individuals in order to process these applications and to make sure that they remain compliant, we would come back to you a year from now and adjust that fee accordingly. That's all. Oh, Should one we? other thing to mention, so sorry. Um, the project development agreements might also have monetary um, community contributions that are outside the scope of a fee. That is done through the project development agreement, is not considered a fee, which is why it is not listed here. Any discussion before we open the public hearing? No, sir. Anybody wish to speak? Do so now. Public hearing is open. Uh, the, can the cannabis agreement is 4-2. That'll be discussed after this. So if you have questions about the master fee schedule, now's the, question, now's the time to ask them. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to close the public hearing. Close. Uh, uh, any further discussion or motion? Um, make a motion to approve resolution 2019 TAC 37. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Uh, Council Member Brown? Aye. And uh, <coughs> Council Member Lyons? Aye. Council Member Shelby? Aye. And I vote aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Second uh, item on the public hearing is 4 2 public hearing, project development agreement, and cannabis regulatory. Uh, permit between the city of Lamore and Valley Pure Lamore LLC. That is Olson. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members. So, the city passed um, the ordinance August 2nd of 2019 and went to effect Ordinance 2019 03 that allows for cannabis operations within the city of Lamore. 
So as part of that development agreement, we're required to bring back the project development agreement and the regulatory permit in a public hearing after being publicly noticed for 10 days for final approval from council. So just I'll hit the highlights of the project development agreement. Um, the fees for operating within, besides paying all the fees related to opening that um, Ms. Spear just went through, um, they've agreed to pay a fee of 5% of gross receipts of the funding coming out of that dispensary. A couple other things they're gonna be doing is basically leasing the, the train depot um, for $2,000 a month. They'll be paying that annually up front. So $24,000 uh, one-time fee as soon as, if this passes, we'll be getting that check this week. They've also agreed to take the depot as is. Is this part of the master fee schedule? You're no, talking? this is part of the project development agreement. Okay. So as part of their occupancy in there, just to kind of set the stage for this, they're, they're taking the depot as is and assuming all responsibility from the arson or the fire damage from the arson we had several months ago. To date, the city has received about $144,000 worth of reimbursements that will not be spent. But um, if if Valley Pier takes possession of the depot, um, that money can go to the general fund reserves. Um, so that being said, there are a few changes from the PDA that, that went out to public comment. Um, these are kind of ongoing documents. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of those changes. There's one section, um, we own the property that the depot's on, but we lease the additional property out behind it and around it from Union Pacific. Um, our lease on the Union Pacific land is currently set to expire in June of 2020. So as, the go, as we renew our, our lease with the railroad, they are charging the city a fee now. It has been verbalized to me in discussions with Union Pacific that the fee minimum is $5,000 a year. So in our contract or in our PDA, um, Valley Pier had agreed to reimburse the city for those fees that we incur on behalf of leasing that land. Um, so they agreed to up to $5,500 um, for the first year plus the annual inflator. The annual inflator can be up to 10% a year according to Union Pacific. Um, the other requested change they would like or they've asked for is, and it's in front of you, there's a couple alternatives. So alternative number one basically is just a change to the proposal. We are estimating that to relocate the skate park and the splash pad, um, we're estimating $700,000 for that project in totality. They have asked for us to add a cap to that, that it would cap at 700,000. I do think those estimates are high based on uh, industry average and going out and talk to people, but I didn't want to underestimate it and be on the other side of that coin. Um, so their alternative one is proposed as is. They will pay 50% um, of the cost to relocate because there we are currently discussing a second dispensary with another company that would also be responsible for 50% of the cost. They've asked for, I did not have um, timing of payments in the original contract. I just said that would be um, due in full upon completion of the project. So they've asked to add language that they would pay 50% of the project costs when we do five days after the notice to proceed is issued. So at the front end of the project, and then they would pay the final payment um, five days after the um, notice of completion is recorded. So pretty much the same exact language, just beefed up a little bit. Um, alternative proposal number two, basically it's the same exact, but they're asking that if for some reason they're the only, if the other company were to back out and then um, Valley Pier would be on the hook for the full 700,000 or the full price of the relocation of the skate park and the splash pad, they're asking that if that's the fact that the city would not issue a second regulatory permit for a dispensary for a period of three years, so they can help recoup some of their some of their costs. So that's option two, and then alternative proposal three is basically all the same terms, but they would just say we'll play a, a flat fee of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards the relocation of the skate park. 
Um, that works fine if both uh, companies, if nobody backs out, but with option three, the risk would be as if one of the companies backs out, the city would be on the hook for some funding to relocate the skate park. So I don't recommend we, we entertain option number three. A um, couple other things you should be aware of was making this decision is we're going after some uh, parks grants and Heritage Park has been kind of destination site for the a new um, where we would move our splash pad to. And as part of that grant application, which we should hear on in November, there is a new state of the art splash pad included in that project. If that should come to fruition, then there would be no need for the developers in this case to spend the funds on a splash pad because it would be a grant from the state. That's one thing. Oh, no, no, no. Pardon me? Yeah. From what I understand, our equipment in the current splash pad is not able to be moved because of state. We're, we're grandfathered in at this point, but it's not when we built that the NSF certifications weren't in place. So basically for a splash pad now the state is requiring um, that you have basically like a community pool type same requirements as you would a, a pool. So, and we're still kind of vetting some of those, those numbers in the law. There has been discussion that do we have to recycle the water or can we reuse it? Basically use it once from the tap, capture it and purple pipe it out and do some irrigation in the downtown area. That might be a way to save some money on, on a park or use it for irrigation, but we're, we're still looking at those options because the project's not even out to bid yet. So the other options are, and um, there's a couple different things you can do. Um, the local jurisdiction has the ability to change the 600 foot rule if they choose to. So you could have the skate park stay exactly where it's at and choose not to move it. Um, but I think right now the public opinion is we should move it. So the um, couple questions on that, you can leave it and, and modify the ordinance or two until, because I honestly think the dispensaries will be ready to open before we have it moved. I mean, this is that we have to go to the, the bid and the, the, follow proper code to bid this thing out. So it's gonna take us probably six months to break ground on a new site. So we can either uh, let them coexist for a little bit, or we could spend somewhere between five and $10,000 and buy some temporary ramps and different equipment that we've identified two locations. There is a private business owner in the downtown area that has cleared everything uh, from a tenant standpoint that he would be willing to house the temporary skate park on his property, which is private property, or there's always inside the CMC. But, uh, you know, the CMC is pretty busy a lot to have a set up there. So the, the preferred method would be to, to give them a spot on private property um, outside of the CMC. So that's really what we're here today to do before we open the public hearing. Just um, we've already passed the ordinance um, unanimously through the Planning Commission and through Council. So tonight is really our first step in issuing the first regulatory permit to operate a cannabis dispensary in the city of Lemoore. I have a question or do I wait? Okay. Question is, you mentioned something about the grants that's possible grant for Heritage Park, but then you stated that um, because that grant and that that possible way forward is not part of the development agreement. Case in point, you said it that, 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 that as the grant monies came through and was looking at building a splash pad at Heritage Park already, there's a, maybe I misunderstood it, there's a possibility we wouldn't relocate the splash pad here or build another splash pad. But my thing is, is they're two different entities. They're, they're you know, so that, what you stated though, is not part of this development agreement. Right, so okay. as, as stated. That has to, yeah. would have to come back to council for determination at that time. But per this development agreement, if, if, if we go through with it, the splash pad and the skate park per this agreement. Would be relocated. Would be relocated. Yes, sir. Period. Yes no matter if we built 15 more splash pads. Correct. Correct. Okay. We, thank would, you. we would come back. So to, to what I like to say is we're, we're, or I'm at least attempting to do our best at being business friendly. Right. You know, if, 
if it if it does come back though that the grant would cover a splash pad we could have the discussion and we could opt to and not that, enforce that portion but it would have to come back for at another that vote. time at yeah, that time but yes, it's sir. not part of is that's yes, what sir. i just want to as make it is clear. right now both of them get relocated right yes sir thank you the, the uh private property owner who's willing to give up his or her land uh, did they give us a time on how long they're allowing us to use their land or is it going to cost us any money or is he just opening up his land with no so that gentleman is in the crowd tonight. So during public comment, I would leave it up to him if he wants to make a comment. But my understanding after meeting with him and with Parks and Rec Director Jason Glick is that if we provide the equipment, like I said, it was between five and 10,000, that he would house, house those children. Um, he kind of takes care of the skate park as it is. He's kind of like the godfather to all the skaters from the neighborhood. So. Um, Jim, I hope I don't embarrass you, but you're doing a good job with those kids and they got somebody they can go to when they when they need something. So question on that is, if I may, uh, zoning and um, just want to. You know, I got to is it is it zoned properly? Is it uh, does it meet uh, all the other requirements within, uh, you know, the 600 foot rule, things of that nature as it went through? I know it's just uh, talk right now, but those would be some of the things, you know, make sure it goes through planning to make sure in our planning department, make sure everything meets, you know where I'm going with yeah, this. Yeah, I, I think we'd have to come back with like a conditional use permit. Yeah, because if it's out of the out of the realm, but it, um, yeah, we would definitely follow the, the proper channels and we have time. Because we also have city that. land, it can go on too. the splash, the, the I mean, is that a correct statement? Yeah, I'm not talking for the reload. I'm talking a temporary place for the kids temporary. to go till we get the Copy. new park built. My bad. Yeah, so they have a My place bad. to go. So is it, is, a, is it an interim step that would probably Beautiful be interim. somewhere between the six to nine months out from the opening of the dispensary? We'd have to have a gap to fill. Copy. Thanks. I offered to do bus tickets and send them to Hanford Skate Park, and that wasn't very well received. No. <laughs> no, I, I, I was going to get the cart ridership up, Dave. I would be there in the bus bringing them back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. The, the yeah. question I have is on the uh, alternate uh, proposal one and two. Uh, are those going to be written into the agreement uh, so that it somebody does back out and there that uh, three year uh, extension takes effect or so that is at the direction of council um but yes so tonight i'm asking that if passed you know you authorize me to execute the pda and then myself and chief smith would sign the regulatory permit so we're asking for those authorizations tonight but it would be pending direction if you want to make a change to the PDA that was given you. So there's a couple change. There's one alternative for the relocation of the skate park. And then the other one was the cap at 5,500 a year for the lease repayment to Union Pacific. Those would be the, the two changes we would write in prior to signing based upon your, your direction given to me this evening. Any more questions before I open it up to public hearing? Okay, open the public hearing. I have a, a card from um, Carol Diaz. I believe it's Carol Diaz. Yes. Carol Diaz, 450 Ash Street, uh, Lemoor. I've lived in Lemoor for a long, long time. I didn't see the first train come into the old depot but I saw the old depot deteriorate. I saw Steve Holbrook bring in that building with high hopes that it was going to revive the historic street of um, Lemoore. And um, I just don't think a pot dispensary belongs right there in the center of that, at that location. I can't believe that there couldn't, another place couldn't be found. I understand the problem with Union Pacific. That's the first time I've heard about it this evening. Uh, and if there's that $5,000 fee, that's apparently the depot is not paying for itself. It's certainly not gonna bring in that amount of money. But I just wish the council would look for another place 
to put a pot dispensary. I don't want to see the town go to pot. Thank you. Thank you. I have another card from Melanie. Melanie, and I'm sorry I don't, I can't. My name is Melody Downey Dack, um, 598 South Acacia. Good evening to Council and Pro, Mayor Pro Tem um, and everyone here. Um, there's a couple of things that I feel like have not been addressed in this um, agreement that was brought up at the, at the August 20th meeting, as well as some things that were brought up at the, I guess it would have been the September 3rd-ish meeting, whatever that one was. Um, one of the issues I think has to do with what is the, the plan for impact on traffic. I mean, I know that Increased foot traffic is a desirable thing, and I agree with that um, for the one dispensary. And what is the you know uh, impact on traffic flow? What, you know, streets or stop signs are going to be changed into street lights and things like that. I just haven't seen anything addressed there, and maybe maybe need to be addressed. Um, the other thing um, mentioned tonight um, in regards to the the change and the how they would determine the money, um, the, the alternatives that you've been city manager. Um, there isn't another dispensary um, and we have to move the skate park and the splash pad. It sounds like um, there's uh, nobody else to cover the rest of that cost. Am I right? I, that's what it sounded like. It would depend on which option they chose. Yeah. So right now as the agreement stands, they, if there's a second, if there's only one party with the current suggesting an alternative which would be that they pay 50 percent is that right well they're asking that if they have to put, pay the full seven hundred thousand because that's a huge chunk right yeah. it takes a while to make that back yeah that the city would only issue so basically we would years. only okay. issue we won't bring in a second dispensary right now we're allowing for two dispensaries and this would uh they're asking if if for whatever reason, the other group we're dealing with were to back out and they yeah. had to pay the full 700 or the full price of the reload, that then the city would not allow a second dispensary for up to three years. So my other, so there'd only be one. Right, so then my other concern is that I think it's um, been made clear to me in conversations with city manager, as well as some, I think, of the comments that were made for the public or the study session before the August 20th meeting, um, that Valley Pure um, is actually more likely interested in another location in Lemoore in the near future, somewhere where they can do cultivation, manufacturing, and distribution, as well as the dispensary. And so if they move in a period of, you know, three, five, six years, what would be the point of moving and, and totally sort of disrupting E Street and leaving that space with no current plan of what to do with where the splash pad and the skate park will be removed from? that space would no longer be family friendly space. And there's a question of what then that would that be done with that space would become blight. Maybe another business would be interested in it. Um, but again, what would have served the purpose of moving all that if Valley Pier doesn't really have the plan. Does anybody else wish to address the city council? Hello gentlemen, how are you doing today? Um, 1359 San Simeon. I'm also a three time business owner here in Lemoore. I own two brick and mortar businesses. One is Tactical Tattoo, the other one is Flowline Sports, directly across the street from the skate park. Um, I did not intend to open Flowline Sports at all. It was kind of um, given to me in a sense. One day I was pretty upset that my kids could not go into the skate park um, because for me, being a single parent, I have to operate my business by myself and I need a place for my two kids to go while I'm working. The convenience of the skate park is it's right behind my tattoo shop so i can physically see the skate park from my back door um, when the day that that was closed my kids came back angry and upset with that he told me what was going on the kids were being um, disrespectful you know they were vandalizing the skate park that type of thing i was pretty upset when i went into that meeting because you know for a kid to say something to a cop and then just to lock the doors on them you know that's they're just shutting down their freedom of speech straight up. You know, that's the number one rule in our constitution is freedom of speech. So if a kid cannot go into a park and say whatever he wants, then how is that not okay? It's, it's definitely not okay just to lock up the skate park because of a few bad words a kid might say to you, you know? Um, maybe contact that kid's parent first, give him a warning, see what happens there. <clears throat> but just to shut down the skate park for, you know, a few words that were being said, uh, it, it didn't sit well with me. So I took it upon myself 
to change the minds of these kids. I, um, at first, they didn't respect me at all. I was actually called a racist. First time I came back into the skate park. I had my hands in building that skate park. I came here to the city council meetings when I was a very young kid. I stood up here with a bunch of other kids, told them how bad we wanted a skate park. And the Rotary was kind enough to build us one, which is a huge thing too. So that skate park should not go anywhere. That was a donation from a club that helps the city. And not only do they help the city, but they fund a large part of their reading material. Um, so the Rotary is doing great things. They gave the kids a park to skate at because the downtown business owners were mad that they were ripping up their sidewalks and stuff. So now we have a situation here where we don't have enough downtown businesses and you know you want to move around stuff to put in a bigger business. Since opening Tactical, I've watched downtown dwindle. The um, antique shop right across from me, owned by a lady, she had both places, she passed away. Those places closed. That immediately stopped foot traffic. Bank of America closed short after. That also, that also stopped foot traffic. Right after that, Farmers Fury closed as well, or they moved, I'm sorry. So for me, being right in the middle of all of those businesses, I lost a ton of money. And I didn't want to put this out there too, but also the massage parlor next door to me closed. Um, that place brought in a ton of money, a ton of foot traffic. It was there for a long time too. Yeah, they had a lot of problems there, but at the same time, you know, they were bringing in downtown business money. Now we have four businesses that are empty downtown all surrounding me, which has stopped our foot traffic. The only foot traffic I get now is from Zenny's Filipino food. Um, most of those guys are military and law enforcement, so I am able to pick up a lot of their business because that's what at my shop we cater to is military and law enforcement. We are tactical tattoo. There's not a lot of places for these military guys to go um, besides maybe a bar or, you know, what world kids to go to. Some of them don't even drink, you know, so they don't want to go to the bar. They come out, they get tattooed, they hang out at the tattoo shop. You know, it's a, it's it's not just tattoos. It's also, you know, keeping people healthy as well. Could you summarize, please? Exactly. Could you summarize your three minutes? So basically what I would like to say is um, I would like you guys to reach out to downtown business owners. Um, I served on a committee, Downtown Merchant Advisory Board. Many of these faces are unfamiliar for me. I was here for two years and I didn't see any of these people. Um, I, there's only one council member here that's been into my businesses. And I think you guys should strongly take in consideration talking to the business owners, talking to downtown, seeing what they want to see. Um, I grew up here too. I have not been here as long as some of the elderly people in our community. But like I said, I have three downtown businesses. I cater to our military and law enforcement. I also cater to our youth. I would like uh, maybe more involvement from our community into downtown. And I definitely, I firmly believe that we should not move the skate park. I think um, we have a great law enforcement here. There's a ton of new hires. The dog handlers are great. They're doing their job, making sure that we're staying safe. If you guys build a big privacy wall on the side of that building, I think it's going to be fine. There's a majority of youth that already. It's, it's time. Okay. Thank you for your time. Any other public comment? Okay. I don't have I have no That's card. Fine. Just just state your name and address. Okay, super. Um, I actually live just a little outside the city limits. Am I still allowed to? Okay. I've been living and doing business in Lemoore for over 30 years. So, um, what, what was your name, ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry, Cindy Carrera. Um, I live in Lacey. Okay, um, I have so many things to say, but I know I only have three minutes. Um, I try to stay out of city business. We have city council members who are well informed, um, and again, I don't live in the city, but. When I recently saw some things that have been going on, they they saddened me, they shocked me, and I felt a real need to come forward. Um, first of all, we just all said the Pledge of Allegiance, which and and a prayer, which is one of the reasons I'm proud to live in Lemoore. Um, 
I'm confused that we said the Pledge of Allegiance while we're discussing breaking a United States law, just to point that out. Um, secondly, I am, have owned many businesses over the years. Um, I'm a lot older than you would imagine. And I, when I heard about um, the young lady from Brazil, Maria Brazil, opening a little shop downtown, a family gathering place was her intention, and that was the quote in the newspaper. Um, I was a little apprehensive just because downtown, foot traffic, that kind of thing. Um, when I discovered that there, the Bank of America was being remodeled, am, am I right? Is the Bank of America being remodeled for a cannabis dispensary, or am I imagining? Is that my imagination? So that is a proposed location for the second dispensary. Okay. But they too will have a hearing publicly noticed like uh -huh. this. But is in there the remodeling? Future. Is the remodeling taking place? I know they're in, working in on plans, but okay. Uh, I saw some some things going on. So. When, when I heard that, all I could think of is who would ask this woman, encourage this woman to spend her life savings opening a family gathering spot, a place for kids' parties, and at the same time be negotiating with a cannabis dispensary two doors down. Am, am I right to be confused? At, I, I, th I feel like I am. And just another door down from that is our beautiful downtown park with a fountain where the children are going to want to play, but potentially we could rename the cannabis tasting room. Could we? I know that the city of Lemoore has an ordinance against tobacco and vaping downtown, but I'm not sure which one of those cannabis falls into or if it does. Um, another, well, I had many points to make, but another point is I'm also confused why the skate park needs to be torn. To, I mean, I get that you don't want the skate park next to the cannabis dispensary, but then I go back to being confused about the family dining spot who an individual put money into next to a cannabis dispensary. So, um, you know, when you're Portuguese, um, they call that shkodoth. Um, that means bending the rules kind of to suit. Um, the second thing is, as, as this young man um, pointed out, and I appreciate that he pointed out, there was a lot of money. The Rotary paid for that skate park, and it was needed where it is because children were skating around downtown. Why? Because that's the neighborhood they live in. That's where we need something for them to do. I don't understand if I said, honey, I want to build a chicken coop. And there was some law against having a chicken coop next to a house in a residential area. So we had the great idea to tear down our house. I'm, I'm, I'm totally confused by that. Why can't this dispensary go somewhere else. If, it is if, not like there's a, not, not a, a shortage of other open business. Could you uh, summarize in 30 seconds or so? Could I summarize on? in 30 seconds? Sure. What What is the draw for the dispensary to be where they're looking for? The only thing that I can see between that and anything else, and first of all, a historic building for crying out loud, is that there's an arbor and a bus station. Are they looking to bus people in? The, um, the costs of, you know, if, if they're busing people in, what else are these people going to want? You know, what other kind of entertainment are they going to need? What is it going to cost the city of Lemoore to 
police that? What is it going to cost to deal with the traffic that this young lady so much brought up? Is Mel Melody, who does such a beautiful job with the city council and the events at the Arbor, is she going to have to have blues, brews, and weed? I'm, I'm astounded, confused, and sad at what's going on. And I really think that the financial issues of Lamore, by the way, I don't think you can build that for 700K. And if you sign it on a paper without getting a bid from someone, I think that's silly. Also, I'd ask to put that money in an escrow account before you build it because Granite Park in Fresno should tell us all how that can sometimes play out. Okay. I'm Thank you for your comment. Uh, any other comments on public hearing? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Uh, discussion? Um, I, have a I think question. we have, we, we've, Go got, uh, we've got to make decisions on what is in the best interest of Lamore. Mm -hmm. And uh, public opinion is important. There's a lot of people that are here. I haven't heard anybody in favor of it, but I'm sure there's people in Lemoore that are in favor of it that didn't show up tonight. I did see on Channel 30 this morning a pretty good uh, presentation on uh, what we we're going to be discussing tonight, and I thought that this room would be full, but I guess I was mistaken. I, we still are charged to do what's in the best interest of more, and uh, we've heard the public has to say, mm -hmm. so what do we have to say? I just wanted to ask the city manager uh, and, and uh, CEO Chamber, she's not here, but uh, you guys went and took a tour, talked to the business owners downtown Lemoore. Uh, could you expound on that a little bit? I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so Amy Ward and I spent several hours over two days walking downtown and visiting the owners and people within the businesses. And I honestly thought it was going to be 50-50 at best. And But we actually had 48 people that said, yep, we need the foot traffic. No, they did say this wouldn't be our first choice of a business, but it'll accomplish getting people downtown. They made comments like we didn't think tattoo shops and massage parlors would be good for the city either, but they haven't been that bad. And we had two absolute no. I would, I would move my business if you brought a dispensary here. So it was 48 to 2, yeah. 48 in favor of. Now, since I've been here in 16, the one common theme I constantly hear is you've got to help get foot traffic downtown. This, this does accomplish that. Um, we did do CEQA on both look on this proposed location as required by the state. So that takes care of the impact of traffic you're we discussing. Um, so CEQA was done by the city planner. Um, as far as destination sites, you know, the, the town of Woodlake has a dispensary. It has about 6,700 people in it. They've been open about 16 months now, and I believe they've had 800,000 people come through their door. And you talk about buses, the buses that go to Yosemite Valley, that is now a destination for those buses. They stop in there on the tour. Um, talking to the city manager, the, the downtown is full now. Their buildings have people in them. It is becoming a place where people actually go downtown. It was described to me as a family comes into town, they go get a hamburger, they're eating. As they order an ice cream cone, the mom or dad might walk into the dispensary come back, join the family, they jump in the car and they go home. There has not been a negative impact to the community of Woodlake and or Kalinga, and that's kind of who we use as our gauge because they're, they're close to us in proximity as well as size. Um, so I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and when you say that they, they you know, because I also heard Woodlake, I mean, I heard it, uh, well, I know for a fact that, uh, you know, other businesses is moving in like Burger King, AutoZone came in, other businesses of that nature uh, came and established in, in Woodlake area. But when they purchase, they just purchase, there's no consumption there. It's purchase, it's in um, 
what I've found out is in a sealed tight bag, child proof by the state of California, that is taken out and that is put in their vehicle. Uh, so there's no consumption on the, on the premises. So I just want to make sure that, uh, but, um, and these businesses are regulated not just by the city, but also by the state. Is that correct? That is correct. The and test. they have a, they have a testing standard that is higher than the food industry for, for different molds and things in the, the product. So when you buy product out of a dispensary, um, a good operator, you can assure a safe product, not the stuff that people are buying on the streets that's laced with fentanyl and things like that mm -hmm. or off the black market. And that, they do both medical and recreational, right? Yes. Okay. Um, what are the, see if there are any other questions. That's about it for right at the moment. Pass there was, there was a, a statement about 700 cars. Do you know where that came from? I think in one of the prior meetings, they were saying foot traffic they were thinking maybe five to seven hundred people a yeah, day i believe is is kind of what the estimate is but it's not continuous uh, 700 cars parking downtown all at once uh, whenever you open up a business yeah. like uh, grocery outlet the first couple of days it was packed madness then it kind of slowed down after that I'm so happy. as as part of the background checks we did have our our pd do background checks and Part of those were were visits to the dispensaries, and part of it was sitting outside doing observations of people in and out. And um, I will say that uh, the reports came back that there was really not a negative impact. I don't think it's in their best interest to make to become a bad neighbor. And, and neither do I. So that's why when we were going through this, we talked about locations and the depot was a primary location just because it has a lot of parking that's available and it's not impacted throughout the day. Um, we're bringing back a study session here on the second meeting in November to address other parking downtown and maybe some hours um, to open up some slots in front of businesses. The Bank of America was also the second chosen business because it has a parking lot attached to it that has over 30 spots. So, it, and the entry would be from the rear of the building. So it doesn't impact the parking along the front side. I did a, I did a web search of uh, Woodlake and I thought uh, my initial uh, thought was I was going to look at a storefront that had flashing uh, CBD oil, you know, or marijuana with a great big arrow pointing towards the door and it's it's amazing how it it doesn't appear to be I don't know what you're selling in that place <clears throat> you know it just says Valley Pure and uh, it's a brick storefront there may be other advertising someplace but it's not apparent so um, I was surprised at the storefront and if it's similar to that I don't think it's going to to uh, generate uh, any comments as far as what the outside of the building is going to look like from my, you know, not knowing what the future is, but seeing what they did at Woodlake. So do uh, you have any comments? Um, yeah, I, I think that, that a lot of people have that misconception that people will go in and purchase it and walk outside and go into their car around the corner. Um, one lady mentioned uh, the gazebo park and and if i'm correct in 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 my knowledge that it's just like a liquor store that allows people to drink in their parking lot that they could lose their liquor license a cannabis company if they're allowing people to to take it out and knowingly smoke it outside of their um their business they could lose their license as well so i i think that that's a misnomer that people have that people are just going to go take it outside and 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 smoke it or eat it or you know in whatever fashion that they want it to buy their their THC okay and we've also got to remember everybody's focused on the THB THC aspect of it um, but if you were here for the study session when all the the different groups came in um, you know a lot of the focus I think is on the CBD aspect of it and, um, and and I think that that and I don't know the numbers I don't have their handouts available but it's in there but uh, quite a bit of their sales are actually the CBD aspect over the THC. And you can get the combination and all that stuff. 
but I, I think that there's some misnomers out there that, that people have and 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 I agree that that we need to make sure, but I think that it could actually help clean up parts of downtown that, that have some illegal activity going in with, with the extra security that, that the companies by law, I believe, have to provide outside, plus all the cameras that they, they need to have around their around their buildings. So and they do provide some roving patrols on the exterior um, for checks. So that helps keep people from congregating. My experience in watching the dispensaries that I've been at are people are in and out. They're yeah. not hanging around. Um, they might go uptown, but they're not hanging out at the dispensary. No. Um, additionally, an operator has to stay within, you know, the guidelines of the state and the local ordinances. And the saving grace for us is, and we don't anticipate any negative impacts. Um, in our initial, that regulatory fee, um, we you, you noticed we didn't add police officers to the street because we couldn't justify based on what we've seen in communities like ours that you can justify hiring more cops because the crime just isn't there. Now, the beauty of it is if, if we were to see something going maybe the way we don't like, every year we have the right to to adjust and add regulatory and we can pass that cost on and if you have an operator that is outside of the guidelines or not being a good operator the chief of police has the sole power to shut them down immediately so it's not like they can just get a, a license and run amok and my experience with dealing with these individuals are they want to be good community partners they don't want to upset the apple cart they want to be welcomed in and uh, it, it's pretty amazing because if you walk around Woodlake and talk to people, there's nobody complaining about Valley Pier. They're grateful and thankful that they're there and that they've helped revitalize their city. And if I can add, I, I, I've never been to Valley Pier. I think I've been to Woodlake twice because my master teacher when I was student teaching lived in Woodlake and I had to go to his house. Um, however, I, I've been to a different dispensary and, um, you know, I went there and walked around kind of like you guys said to like the police did just to kind of see because I, I i went in negative i i really did um thinking the worst and and it was traffic coming in and out nothing major literally from here to probably heck maybe the other side of the library so to the end of the block uh, there was a dance academy for girls and boys youngsters and i'm like seriously and they're like, yeah, the parents actually, some parents, not all of them, let's make no mistake about it, but a lot of parents will go drop their kids off at dance, they make their appointment, they come in, and when the kids get out, they get out and they meet up and and, and it was eye-opening. I sat there on my own and watched it and, and I, I was like, holy cow. So, you know, it, it can be family friendly, like, like uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Plourd said, God, what did I, I was just going to say something. Yeah, I, I went in thinking you're going to have neon signs and stuff. And, and if you didn't know what this place's name was, you wouldn't know what industry they were in. It, it was that, um, I don't want to say camouflaged, but but it wasn't the advertising that, that you would think if, if you haven't visited one. So I guess we have a couple of things to, to discuss. Uh, option uh, one or two, the question I had on option one and two is, uh, it, is the developer gonna be tied to prevailing wage or are they outside of that? So because it is a city project, they are subject to prevailing wage, but the way we're doing that is the city will take the lead on the building of it because it is going into a city facility. So city staff will facilitate the bid process and the project through completion and will be reimbursed via this agreement for the cost. So the city has control of the project throughout. So, uh, and the other thing is uh, option, uh, alternate proposal one and proposal two deals with uh, well, proposal one uh, or two only takes effect if, if the person uh, 
the second permit holder backs out. Is that correct? That is correct. So can we write that into the, the agreement? Um, I believe it's. I mean, it'd be open ended if, if the other applicant chooses not to uh, pull a permit, then. Yeah. Um, council members, if you look at the last paragraph, it, it kind of says that, but we can add clarity if you like. But it said if the developer is required to reimburse the city more than the minimum 50%, so half proportional share of the relocation of the skate part and splash pad. The city agrees it shall not issue a second regulatory permit for a period of three years from the date of the execution of this agreement. So it's in there. I guess I would defer to legal if we need to clean up that language, if that's the option you choose to go. So it is, it is implied in that last paragraph, but if council desires to make it more clear, we can do that as well. Uh, City Attorney, you reading that paragraph, do you think it's sufficient? Or, I mean, because your State of Council can, can make a recommendation, but in your, your opinion, do you think it's sufficient? In my opinion, it's sufficient. Thank you. Well, uh, I had some testimony that that there's a lot of people that, that don't want to blast the uh, the splash pad and the uh, the uh, the skate park move, but I think it's in the best interest to move them uh, if we decide to go ahead with the uh, the development agreement. So uh, I would. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of looking at alternate proposal two being the better of the two. Am I? Uh, am I, I more or less uh, I reading it right? Yeah, yeah I, I would I agree, agree with that. Just so that the city's not on the hook for the uh, the extra in case that other entity bows out. Am I? Right. I, I, am I, I. Yeah, three could cost us money. It feels like one kind of leads towards the business. Two leans kind of towards the city, and. Ultimately, our job is to do what's best for the city. I, I vote for two. Well, uh, the other thing is uh, I was rolling around in my mind that, uh, you know, Woodlake is, is, has an operation that's kind of blind to the public as far as uh, its operations go. The people that go to, the, to their facility go there do their business and leave mm -hmm. so it's you know a, we're going to move the splash pad and the skate park for the convenience of those people that feel that it might be hurting their children to be in the vicinity of that store which i don't think it's going to have an impact on them yeah. but well, i think we're doing it uh, we're we're going to propose to do it uh, in the best interest of public opinion, you know, not because there's going to be a problem, but because it could be a perceived problem in the future. So we're going to move it to eliminate a perceived problem that may or may not exist. So uh, kind of like uh, make the skate park move someplace else. And I personally think we'd be better off with a better skate park. That skate park is kind of dangerous. Uh, I mean, it has some elements that some skateboarders would probably like to change, and it could be improved. And I understand there's some uh, some expert skate park uh, visitors that know what they're doing as far as developing a skate park. And those people would be, if I might just interject, those people in the the you know the the moving of the skate park and all that, they would be. Um, discuss, talk to, you know, probably be part of that. Uh, would you say that's a true uh, city manager? Yeah, so there's many designs out there and people that do this have people on board, but our intent was to get some of the local skaters mm -hmm. and Tim, and I know Tim holds events, he gets some of these 
professional skaters have been through town through his shop. So we're we're kind of looking at getting a, a local the local input. Okay. Thank you. And the yeah. skate park is still going to be called the Rotary Skate Park, correct? Yes, the name will go with it. And the uh, the as far as a historical standpoint, the that particular depot was moved from Stratmore. And uh, I know it's historical because it has my name on a brass plaque. So my name's going to be on the front of a CDB, <laughs> CBD dispensary. And, you know, I kind of never thought I'd have an, my name on the front of a dispensary if, if you know, it's kind of curious. But <laughs> it would make it even more historical if that was to happen. Now, the exterior, though, the exterior of the facility and, and all of that, uh, can you expound on that there, city manager? Yeah, uh, I mean, when they do the renovation, of course, you know, we got the fire damage, things of that nature. Uh, I don't know. And city attorney shut me down if I'm going too far. So, uh, but no. So, so basically on the, on the exterior of the building, they'll be fixing some dry rot and some fire damage. Um, they'll be adding a secondary ramp in the rear for ADA access, but it'll be all wood planks. So, um, that's really the extent of the exterior and fresh coat of paint. Interior wise, I think they're going to add one wall uh, to the inside because because basically how these work is you come in to a staging area and that's where you're checked for your ID to, to ensure you're 21 years old and you're logged in. And then you're you're literally buzzed in to go in to the product area. So it's not like you can just run into this place and gain access to the store. You're behind. You have to be buzzed in, and and, and they sequence you in. I, I will be honest. I was a little uh, surprised to hear Tim Welsh say that as a parent and his kids use the skate park. That I kind of got the vibe that he'd like to see it stay right where it was. And then I was a little even more surprised to hear you say that technically we could leave it right where it was. Um. I don't know where I'm going yet. <laughs> so I'm trying to trying to talk my way there. Is, am, I, am I allowed to ask Tim Welsh a question? Is that okay? You can for clarification, but for public purposes, the hearing's been closed. So if you want to take it as testimony, Mayor Pro Tem would need to open the public hearing again. Once he opens it, it needs to be open for everybody in the audience to come up and comment if they want. Well, I don't know if we want to go down that road. <laughs> Yeah, I want to ask him a question. Can, can you open back to public comment? The public hearing is open. Um, do you see it not being a problem with the dispensary locating going into the train depot and having your kids right there at the skate park? Now, I know that you have an unfair advantage over other parents because you got line of sight on them. But do you not see that being a problem or an issue or? So I don't see it being a problem, no, because if you populate the business, which would be the train depot, it's going to kick a lot of the riffraff out. And with more security, um, there's going to be less chance of an issue happening. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I think by populating the area, it's gonna, um, you know, decriminalize it. Right now, we have a situation where a lot of the homeless congregate in the fountain area um, on D Street and also in the splash pad area. They sleep there at night. And um, I know this because I have cameras set up from my business, so I'm able to see the front. And they come in at night and the kids come in in the morning with the, you know, the younger parents and stuff to use the splash pad and the parents kind of have to kick them out so that the kids are able to use the facility. And I think by opening up a business like Valley Pier, it's gonna create security, it's gonna populize the area and it's gonna decriminalize whatever's going on in the street. I'm kind of gonna turn you into a pub or like a subject expert. So would, uh, would you, you wouldn't rather see the skate park move and possibly get a better one or a bigger one with newer 
I, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't skate, man. I, I will break my neck, but uh, <laughs> you, I know you don't know what the question I'm asking. I understand. Um, so yes and no. Yes, we would like to see a better skate park and improvements, but I don't think it should be moved. I think if we're going to make improvements on a skate park, why can't we do it where it's currently at? Well, yeah, but there's the reason for moving it. Is, is there a way we could pull our public and even ask if we need to move this, if the public would? I, I know I'm like a day late and a dollar short asking these questions now, but it's so. I guess I would answer that is I think there's a lot of residents or some residents that are scared of the unknown. So I don't know if it would be a fair assessment right now. Um, I would propose maybe that if that's something council wants to look at or allow that maybe we do allow the skate park and Valley Pier to coexist for a small period of time while we operationally so that. people can kind of see and live it. Um, I honestly don't think I, I'm with Mr. Welsh. I don't think there'll be a, a negative impact to, to the skate park if it stays there. I think Whoa. it's more of a just a, a, a perception issue at this point. But we're not going to know until people until we have it here, people that haven't taken the time to go visit these communities and talk to people that live there and haven't spent the time they're they they're basing it off off a personal feeling not not a fact yeah. i was one of those people yeah the 600 foot rule uh, is going to have to be modified at the yes time. we would have to we would have to modify the the 600 foot rule on that ordinance but that's something that would be brought back at a later time so if at this point in time we would if if this thing this project development agreement if it is passed what we're looking at right now, though, is just this just a uh, to go f if we're going to go forward with this or not with one of the proposals. That's what's on the table today. Then at a later date, we would talk about these things, bring it maybe to a study session to figure out what, what our next step. Is that a correct statement? Uh, that is a correct statement. OK. Um, one of the thing is, too, is if I may, is, you know, um, is, you know, and I'm not a skater, you know, I've got kids, grandkids and stuff, but I look at it too is, is, you know, is for a skate park, I'm just saying, and, and then I'll hush up because I think I might be going too far, but um, is for a skate park for everybody to get to it. You know, I know it's in the center of our city, you know, um, you know, but that'd be just something to think about. You know, and I know you have. I mean, you're right, and I think it's in a great location because somebody mentioned earlier the the bus, the transit, the car bus is right down the street. So mm -hmm. a lot of the kids, you know, they do come from different parts of the area. The skate park isn't just for the kids in town. The skate park is there because it's centrally located. Um, I would, I did not grow up in the area of where the skate park was built. I would have much rather seen it built you know, over by 19th and 198. So I didn't have to go very far, mm -hmm. um, but that didn't bother me, even though it was built in okay. center of town, I still made the truck every that's, day after school. Thank you. I, that's, that's what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear what, you know, right. Cause to me, like uh, Stuart said, or council member uh, Lyons are, you know, I sound like you're a subject matter expert on this. To me, I would say, oh, you know more than I do, well, you know, when it comes to the usage of that park, I mean, I see kids in there at times and, things of that nature. I, I was volunteering policing for years and I did patrol downtown and they'd patrol all over this town on Friday nights. And I seen what happened throughout the town, you know, and, um, but, uh, no, thank you. I myself have over 20 skateboarding tickets inside the skate park. Oh, okay. For not wearing a helmet. Oh, yeah. Well, so as well, an adult, <laughs> so, as a, thank, thank as a you. Minor before I was yeah. Thank you for your answer. I'd like to <laughs> thank, thank you. Like to ask anybody else who would like to address the ski park uh, move. I got two people, three, mm -hmm. at least two, three people. Tom Reed, ten sixty five, or more. In all this discussion, I haven't heard about where you're going to relocate the skate park to. Has that been decided? So the proposed plan right now that we're going out to get some quotes on would be on the east side of the soccer complex. So right. 
you would have uh, access off Cinnamon, which is right next to the CMC, but we have the, the RV place that's in between us. Mm -hmm. So right on that eastern fence line where the, the fields are there, you would you could access it from inside the park or along Cinnamon. It would have a lighted walkway to get to it, but it would be nested right in there, probably 300 feet off of Cinnamon Drive. Okay, thanks. Uh, next. What we're talking about is should we move the skate park or not move the skate park, from what I understand. Hi, I'm Melody Downing Duck again. I wanted to give my input because you know, the city manager and I spoke um, at length a couple weeks ago. Um, and I know that I'm one of the people that are, are saying, like, I don't think that it's a great idea to have the dispensary in the depot. Um, but again, I, I would I would be on the same page with Mr. Walsh here that part of my concern was removing, disrupting that space. Um, I think that um, he suggested maybe a wall, you know, like somewhere to maybe divide it a little bit more, um, partly just because of, um, you know, not negative traffic, but just traffic flow. Um, and so just speaking for myself, somebody who's concerned about the family friendly aspect, I don't have a problem with the dispensary in Lemoore per se. I just was concerned about that particular location and the fact that, you know, it's like, okay, well then, where what would be done with that space and where would the family friendly space go because my family does use that space a lot as well as the gazebo park and i do know that there are sometimes you know questionable things that are going on there and i welcome extra security so i just wanted you guys to know like for somebody who's expressed concern about that um that i am not necessarily opposed to a trial period of seeing whether it would pose a problem um i, I feel like removing it and disrupting it so quickly it seems a worse idea than maybe kind of, you know, giving it some time to work itself out a little bit because it just, again, especially if Valley Pier maybe isn't planning to stay at that location for an extended period of time, then to disrupt something like, you know, you mentioned that Rotary had donated years ago and all of that. Um, it just seems like a, a big disruption that's maybe not necessary. So I just want to. Thank you. So it, it. Next. We have your name for the Good record. afternoon, Council. My name is Brittany Bush. I'm here. Uh, just got here like a couple weeks ago in the military. Um, just wanted to speak on the experience of having it in a neighborhood where it's close to family friendly um, uh, locations. We just moved here from Oak Harbor, Washington, and there was a couple of dispensaries in our neighborhood. One close across the street from a church and another like a couple of feet away from um, residents. There isn't an issue with it being a, a negative impact. It did bring a lot of traffic to Oak Harbor because they were uh, in the midst of kind of a decline in, as far as revenue goes in that area. Um, also with it being um, a lot of children, a lot of high schools, a lot of elementary schools right in that area, there was never an issue of children being, um, I guess, tempted to enter. Like you said, they are, set up where there's a wall where you have to show your ID before you get entrance into the actual dispensary. Um, and there's also many cameras and there's somebody right at the door to like stop that negative traffic or miners trying to get in and, and purchase the purchase. But as far as it affecting your skate park and moving it, I, like he said, um, it really probably wouldn't even make a difference to it, it being the homeless people there inhibiting it or it being a dispensary. Um, I've never seen children try to get into the dispensaries, basically, yeah. is what I'm trying to say. But, so it, leaving your skate park would probably be a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Matthews, 195 West Burlwood Lane. Um, just, it sounds kind of like the conversation is shifting more towards maybe leaving everything um, how, it, how it is and maybe improving it in that way. And I was just wondering if there might be a plan B as far as what <clears throat> Valley Pier might contribute to the city if they're not, um, if it ends up that they don't end up moving the splash pad or making a bigger, better um, skate park if there was um, something else that, that they were thinking of. Because I know a lot of people have uh, an issue with it coming to town. Um, but when they kind of sweeten the deal a little bit with what they can do for our city, it kind of helps a little bit. So I was just wondering if there was another plan as far as that goes. So uh, are you in favor of moving the park or leaving it there? 
personally? Yes. Um, I I don't know. I would. I don't. I don't have kids that would use it. Um, my kids are grown. Um, my granddaughter is extremely accident prone, so if I have anything to do with it, she won't go down there. Um, but uh, I, I don't see anything wrong with the wait and see aspect. Um, but there are a lot of people that I have seen that do have a big problem with it being so close. And I could understand as a, as a parent, um, maybe with kids that use that, why you would have that apprehension. But I personally, I... I wouldn't know if it would be an issue or not be an issue. So I can't really speak on that, but um, if it turns out that it's a non-issue and it um, they coincide and there's no issues, I was just wondering if there was some type of backup plan or if there was something else that. So if, if I get what you're asking, you're saying right now they're willing to pay 350,000 to relocate it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't need to relocate it, are they gonna do something else for the city, I be it improve the current skate park. If, if I don't know if there's enough room, is that kind of what you're asking? Correct. Okay. Yeah, just um, just for clarification. Yeah, Sorry. To kind of, I don't want to say sweeten the deal, but just kind of, at least some people might feel that they're getting like improving the city, and yes, if that all if if it ends up they don't end up doing those two things, um, then it's kind of like, what are they doing? So, any other questions? Thank you. Anybody else? One more? Two more? Two more. Three more? I have an additional question. What's the estimated income of sales tax and fees that the city of Lamar will bring in? So, we're estimating probably about $500,000 a year in income off the dispensaries which is we currently bring in about 2 million in sales tax revenues. So that's a 25% increase. You have to sell a lot of hamburgers to get. Well, <laughs> I don't see any men's stores, clothing stores, um, or any other stores coming back into downtown if we can't even keep a bank. So foot traffic or no, I don't know how much this is going to improve downtown or more. But as far as the rest of the income, yeah. fine. I'm not going to count it before we get it. Uh, right. Someone else? And I think we had one more person back there that wants to talk. Good evening. Just wanted to get some clarification. I know there's talk of moving the skate park, not moving it. Just to give everyone clarification where we're at in Woodlake. The rec center is 60 feet behind our building. Kids there all day. 6 to 14, multiple leagues, basketball, wrestling, indoor soccer. We don't have any problems. We don't have any issues. We do increase the security. Our cameras, we can see blocks away. Nobody's coming in there. Nobody's loitering around. We do daily sweeps. We make sure that everybody's safe and everybody's calm. We want to help your city flourish. We're not here to cause any problems or push anybody out. If one person was to leave and say their business was going to leave, we'd work with them to make sure they wouldn't leave. We want them to come. I do know the facts of the people we do bring, and we do bring good people. We're not bringing bad people to your city. We're bringing tax revenue. Um, there's another project or something you guys are looking at and everything like that i mean the revenue's there it, it's definitely with the facts um, we just want you guys to know we're here to support you guys and help with anything we don't have any ill wills but anybody's opinions or anything like that we we hear it all the time uh, we just want to come here and help you guys flourish thank you for your time thank you and one more comment uh the lady in the back uh was correct i promise 30 seconds <laughs> Um, on the contract, whether it goes one way or another, I heard something about a cap of 800000 um, and I realize that the city will have a lot of extra income, but, you know, whenever there's more money that comes into a home, it always manages to get spent. So I would just caution about the cap. I would caution about having estimates, knowing what this is going to cost before you make any kind of a deal. You're speaking that's, on, on that's moving the, the pad and, and the, yeah, the, on the skate potential park? Okay. Because it looks like there's going to be a wait and see, and I appreciate everyone's opinions on that. But should wait and see fall to something else, I hate to see there being a cap as costs are increasing that the city needs to bear the difference of. Uh, just you. for clarification, uh, we're, we're going to 
if if the resolution passes tonight it doesn't go into effect until we have another vote in 30 days is that right or no 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 no. that's for an ordinance this was the public hearing just for the um project development agreement and for the regulatory permit there's no second hearing so we're going to move we're going to have a vote on the agreement as modified then if that's how council would like to proceed yes okay so thank you for your comment. Thank you, everyone. Are, by the way, are you in favor of keeping the park where it is or moving it? It breaks my heart to see that people who donated to the Rotary for this project and the Rotary who built it are going to watch it be torn would, down. Would you be in favor of keeping it there for 90 days to see what happens? And then if I it, think it, I think it would need to be more than 90 days, which means that the contracts um, would need to be extended you know, the period of time for those would need to be extended and again the longer things take six months to get a bid six months to build a park minimum so you're looking at a year of trying to figure it out okay Sorry. Thank, thank you thank you for your 30 seconds <laughs> and no other public comment i'm going to close the public hearing council yeah i something you know because brought up a, a good point there is that you know if if this development agreement is agreed to tonight or the way it's written with one of the alternate proposals if the skate park if it's decided to skate park in in, in the future is not moved uh, i don't think that, i think that was even brought up and so um that would mean this portion of of it would be null and void is that right since it's ain't gonna move it Correct. it's just so um so you know i as as and i i, I don't want to get in you know negotiations <laughs> but you know where i'm going with this so <laughs> so council, council members if i could just kind of add a little bit so the owner of Valley Pier um, has taken the time to get to know me, get to know our city, and spend a lot of time here. Um, I'd say he's kind of a humble guy. He doesn't go out and talk about what he does for the community. But I can tell you, talking to the city manager and the police chief, the guy goes above and beyond in helping his city out when asked. And you do that when you're profitable. So you know, coming in, if they got to spend 700,000, that cuts in. I have no doubt. I mean, it's not on paper. And, and even when we were writing, uh, when we were going through the development agreements and we talked about community benefit, um, cause other people listed, oh, we're going to do A, B and C for the community. Right. His, his comment was look, we'll, we'll help it on the depot. Our community benefit will speak for itself when we're in your town. Well, if I so, may, if I may expound on that, because I went to a regional planning, uh, summit over at, uh, at the reservation probably about six or eight months ago. Uh, Mayor Woodlake was there. Other people were there. Uh, Woodlake got an award for their planning and their development and uh, they based it, the mayor basically stated it was, it was a lot had to do with um, the donations from Valley Pier. Okay. So I understand where you're going, you know, I understand what you stated. Um, you know, um, could I, I'm, just, I'm, 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 I'm with Councilman Reliance right now. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pause or I have to take a pause for a moment. Yeah. Good. good. Uh, I think it'd probably be a good idea to try to hammer down the language a little bit better? Or could we bring this back at a special meeting and just, uh, you know, give us a, give you a couple of days to change the language to incorporate the items that we talked about tonight? If, you know, but the, if I may expound, you know, like if X doesn't happen after we do a review and, you know, we get results back where it says that we're not gonna move this gate park, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think what city manager 
was saying is that that it's already proven that that the owner of Valley Pure is more than willing, and if he doesn't have to, or if his company, however you want to put it, doesn't have to spend seven hundred thousand on the relocate relocation of the of the splash pad and the right. thing that he'd be more than willing, maybe not seven hundred thousand, but to to give a little bit more because obviously, you know, because so, but but that would just be on on a man's word. So so if I'm if I'm speaking honestly, um, as as somebody who comes from private business before I came to the public, you know, this is a a good faith to move and if it changes i almost feel like going back and changing the verb is say well if you can save because we don't have to move you we still want you to do this i don't know if that's good faith negotiations from where if i'm if i'm being honest do i think they would be they would entertain helping us out if we asked them i, I can almost say i know they will i'm just but, saying if we leave the skate park there for 90 days and there's no reason to move it then we don't have to go into he doesn't have to pay out that information that money to move it because it's not moving right so i'm asking uh if you could rewrite it and get the owner to agree to it then come back with a special meeting and get it approved it shouldn't take that long that he doesn't have to pay if it doesn't move isn't that the reason he's paying the money in the first place is to move it right but the way this reads if if uh if we don't take the project to bid there's there's no notice to proceed which would never trigger a payment in the first place it's already in there basically if we don't but do a notice will. to proceed if, yeah, and a notice to completion there's there's no fees to bill them for but after 90 days if we decide that it's ready it's an impacting uh commercial business then he should move it and that's what we were talking about it's just bending that part for 90 days or some period of time to see if there was an impact am i correct am I that, that's part of it the other thing too is as you know i mean we're, we're i just want to i just want to make the, the statement is that you know we're talking about move not move move not move you know i've talked to a lot of people in the city of lamore okay <laughs> majority of people i've talked to they want they they told me they you know move it okay uh, my thing is 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 you know if the people of the city of lamore are okay with it leaving it there the majority of the people okay so be it you know um if the pad i guess if the pad isn't moved or the and and, and the skate park's not moved then there will be no bid submitted and 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 so there will be no project so that would be the period at the end of the sentence so there that would be that portion of the contract would be null and void correct or, right but we've got to make sure we do our due diligence and, and go to the people you know and beat that drum you know and and make sure that's what the majority of the people of the city will more want so um so Luke, I'm, I'm, can I ask you I'm, a question? If I could say is I'm okay with <laughs> leaving the alternate proposal. Um, you know, I like two and um, ready to, I'm ready to make a motion. Yeah. So what you're saying is, is if we go ahead with alternate, the proposal number two, that if we never get to the point where we don't do the work, then we never bill them and they don't have to pay it anyways. Well, now I don't know what this would do on the legalese. Where, where at the end. I'm not an attorney, but or attorney, I don't know what this would do in the future, because in the future, 20 years from now, it's decided to move the pad. Then you have the clause in there, and they would be obligated to pay. Then they would be it. obligated. So I go back to. Uh, uh, well, let's not worry about well, 20 years. Let's worry about six months from now. No, no, no. I've been down there. I ain't <laughs> no, been down I, that road. I, I, <laughs> I, I would agree, but. I, as, as I read proposal number two, it says developer agrees to pay 50% of the proportional share within five business days from the date of issuance of the notice to proceed with construction of the project, the project being the new. Yeah. So if we never, this, this is, it, this is forever. Yeah. It, yeah. It I mean, forever. Yeah. but I mean, it says 50% maximum 100%. So yeah. another, well, I, I was right. just reading yeah. that, that once the project is yes, sir. proposed or I want to get this. So just because the we move notice to proceed with the construction. So if, if, if we do that tomorrow, hypothetically, or 120 days from now, 
it's still written in the contract that I, I don't think that we need to extend it and, and try and put that verbiage in yeah. because I think it's it's yeah. currently in. Would you get, you got me on that? I agree. Okay. And, and you, if I could just real quick as well, um, when Miss Melanie came up earlier and talked about a fence, there actually is verbiage in the PDA that a privacy fence will be put up on the property line between the splash pad and the depot. It's already in there. And that driveway directly between the the train depot and the splash pad will not be for general public to gain access to the parking lot. That'll be maybe one truck a day only for deliveries. So there, there's some of that in the privacy fence already. And I would like to thank Melanie for coming by my office. Um, we spent I don't know, an hour or so probably. Uh, we didn't always agree, but we mutually respected one another. And she showed a lot of class by sending me a thank you card in the mail. So I appreciate that. I don't get that that often. Thank you. Any other discussion? Go no, ahead. just want to, from the city attorney, once again, just want to confirm that, uh, so I make sure I understand, you're saying that the way the pro alternate proposals are written, they'll stand. And, right, and, and I'm looking specifically at proposal number two, because that's the one you referenced. Copy. Okay. You make a motion. May I make a motion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, make a motion to uh, appro approve project development agreement uh, with alternate proposal number two, Second. as stated here. Well, in the and, and, <laughs> and the regulatory and the regulatory permit and the regulatory permit and the fifty five hundred for the lease and the fifty five hundred for the lease. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and That's the fifty five hundred foot square. Yeah. Second. Lease. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, Council Member Brown. Aye. Council Member Lyons. Aye. Council Mem Member Shelby. Shelby. Uh, I'm scalding. That's all right, though. Uh, aye. <laughs> no worries. And I vote You're aye. <laughs> motion approved. Uh, I'm going to hit the mayor. <laughs> all right. You're doing good, John. Yeah. Council Member Fleury. Mayor Pro Mayor, I'm just messing up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey. Uh, we're on uh, new business new business five, section five. Okay, new business is section 5-1. Report and recommendations approval of the recommendation of city position of the 2019 League of California League of Conference resolution. Okay, so um, again, good evening, Mayor and Council members. This is for the, the two resolutions on the ballot for the League of California City meetings that the mayor will be attending as our proxy for the vote. So there's there's two resolutions. The first one, and I'll just read it as written, resolution of the League of California Cities calling on the California Public Utilities Commission to amend Rule 20A to add projects in very high fire hazard severity zones to the list of eligibility criteria and to increase funding allocations for Rule 20A projects. Basically what this does is Rule 20A through different fees that are collected by the public utilities commissions goes to help underground utilities. This will add um, high fire risk areas. So you know how they're talking about shutting down in high wind conditions to avoid spark and fires. This adds those high risk areas to the 28 ruling. Um, it doesn't really cost the state any money other than the person that it will take to add this to the program and the uh, the program is paid for by the utilities, and um, the the general contractors doing work they get credits for doing these things. So um, on this one, we're going to recommend that council support it and vote in support of this resolution. And then resolution two, um, this one's a little bit different. It's a resolution calling upon the federal and state governments to address the devastating impacts of international transboundary pollution flows into the southernmost regions of California and the Pacific Ocean. 
So this is really about the waterways from Mexico coming into the United States and the pollutants. Um, 10 years ago, this project was funded federally with $100 million to, to clean up the waterways and you know have positive impacts. Um, it has since been defunded to about $10 million a year. And um, all this resolution does is basically says that the League of California Cities is going to go talk to both the federal and the state governments to ask them to continue working and increase funding to try to cut down on the pollutants. Um, there wasn't a lot of detail on this. They're not getting into funding or how it's going to get paid for. It's just asking them to work together. I'd like to think that something that critical with a $10 million budget that somebody's already discussing it. So my, uh, the recommendation on this one is just to abstain from the vote unless council would have, uh, I kind of told the league, I'd rather see them spending their time getting water to the valley versus trying to clean up a, a river that's they've been working on for a decade plus already. So that's, that's it. I'm just looking for, or we need to give Mayor Neal consensus on how you want them to vote. Well, I, I've got something to say about that. Resolution number one basically says a resolution of the League of California Cities calling on the California Public Utilities Commission to amend some projects of dealing with fire hazards. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a good idea. Let's do it. I think it's a good idea. We ought to do it. So I agree. So, vote yes. Agreed. The other one uh, deals with a resolution calling upon the federal and state government to address the devastating impact of international boundaries uh, dealing with pollution. We're talking about the Tijuana River and the New River in Imperial County. This was uh, when they say it's calling upon uh, the federal government and state government to address the devastating. I think that's a good idea. They should work together. Uh, there were council members from Brawley, Santee, Vista, uh, Escondido, uh, Escondido, and uh, La Mesa. We're talking city managers and council members and mayors that thought it was a good idea, as well as uh, the cities of San, the Council of uh, San Diego, Imperial Beach, Coronado, and uh, Calexico they wanted to push to uh, have the state and the federal government work together to try to address the issue. And I don't think we should abstain. I think we should vote yes, they should work together. I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's a good idea. Sure. So that's what I think. And uh, we are going to send a, uh, the mayor down there to either hold up his card or not hold up a card, and I think uh, I think he should hold up a card, voting yes on those two Absolutely. resolutions. Even though the city manager says we should abstain because it doesn't contain enough information, basically it's saying yeah, it's a good idea or it's a bad idea. And I think when you abstain, you're effectively saying it's a bad idea, even though you're abstaining, you're not voting, but it'll effectively count as a no vote. Correct. Okay. So uh, I think it's a good idea, uh, both the resolutions, and uh, that's where I sit on that issue. I uh, concur. Comments? Yeah. Yeah. Concurrence? Um, yes. That's all you need is concurrence on this? Do you need yes. a, what do you need from um, I would actually request a motion because of the way the agenda reads. Um, it's not just looking for direction, um, but you would need to open it up to the public too. Any more discussion on that? Any more discussion? Sure. I'm going to open it to the public. Anybody want to expound on this item? No. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Reed, 1064, I'm really more. All of the cities and counties that you listed as in favor of that are in Southern California. It sounds like a Southern California uh, initiative, and, and they should take care of it. And so I would recommend a no vote. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? It's an international problem. She should do the podium. Excuse me. You can, you can come to the dais, ma'am. Thank you. 
It's an international problem. It affects both countries and dirty oceans don't do anybody any good. And if as a state we can't support Southern California, they're not gonna support Northern California with the fire problems or Central California with our water problems. I think we ought to support them to see if those um, rivers can be cleaned up because they are a mess. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else from the public? I see somebody got the scope on me over there. <laughs> this sucks. Uh, I'm gonna close it. Give it back to. The I don't think council. we're. I, I don't think we're asking the city, the, the League of California Cities, to demand that the federal government or state government spend a dime. It's just saying we're in favor of it, or no, we're not in favor of it. Yes, and uh, what the federal government does with uh, the state of California is uh, something that has to be negotiated. And uh, so it's an international boundary. The waterways flow into our country from someplace else, and it's asking, let's try to work it out. And uh, Absolutely. I, I think abstaining is, is saying, okay, we're turning a blind eye to it. It doesn't affect us. It's not in our backyard. Let's not do anything. But I think that we should support those counties and cities down there that are dealing with the issue, even though it's probably not going to generate one more penny in funding. So uh, that's what I have to say about that. So I'd like to make a motion to uh, vote yes on both of the topics and uh to um and that's it <laughs> I'm, and I'm sorry brown. i apologize i was second oh, here you go second by mr scotty mr brown aye mr scotty aye mr lyons aye mr fluid aye and i vote aye motion carries okay last call six City Council Reports and Requests, Section 6, 6-1, City Council Report Request. Mr. Brown. Um, nothing really to report out, uh, but just want to thank everybody for the dialogue tonight. I think it was pretty good. I think we had some good conversation. Um, that's what this is all about. You know, um, you know, we walk out at the end of the day respecting each other. So that's all. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lyons. Okay, I want to start by saying I'm sorry for opening 4-2 back up the way I did. <laughs> that took a lot longer than I was expecting. Um, but in all honesty, it's good. It good. I, I, I felt like it, it didn't feel like it was done for me. And after hearing Mr. Wells talk, I was like, oh, my goodness. I, I can't believe I'm going to run us down this road. But I did it. So, But I still apologize. And I would also like to thank uh, – Amy Ward, who already left for the dinner that she put on for or the lunch for the first responder award. Um, I'd also like to thank Chief, and that's why I got my my mug up here today. I went to the uh, how did you say it? Coffee with a cop? Yes. Yeah, I thought it was uh, donuts with the cops or something like that, but it was coffee. <laughs> um, I bet they had a donut somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was at Starbucks, so there was. There was some stuff there. I think you have to fill out an FPPC. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to thank Chief for his service. Uh, that's that's no easy feat that you did right there. Um, KCO, everything's going good with KCO. Um, I did receive Brown Act training there again. That was a lot of fun. Um, the Commission on Aging there. So their event that they had the uh, oh what was his name the Garner the guy that sang in the park. So they had their uh, the concert in the park. So that, that went well for them. They made money off of it, so that's good. So I did go to the mosquito abatement uh, meeting like you asked me to do, and they didn't have it. So I showed up for nothing on the 25th. I am so sorry. It's, it's all good, but I learned a lot about mosquitoes that day. I, I stayed and had my own little meeting anyways. <laughs> now he has Wes now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then... So, Mr. Uh, City Manager, I have a question for you about the landing zone. Do you know anything about the landing zone that's now out in Enterprise? Yes, I do know of its existence. That's good. So, um, 
I think it's all donated. Everything there is donated. The land is donated. And even I think Stony Sand and Gravel, uh, Mike and Carol Evans, they donated the, the blacktop that's out there. And there's some leaky lights and stuff out there. Um, and it's, I, I can't remember the name of the street. Um, Enterprise. Enterprise and, and what? Commerce. 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 So those that don't know, we have a landing zone in town. I, I mean, it's nothing to rival, you know, probably la or san diego but it's a landing zone and it's paved and it's it's not too shabby it's a and good spot to land a helicopter and it's, it's safe, safe. It used <laughs> yes more it's, often than more than most people think just kind of wanted to put that out there let everybody know and i uh, also went to a a mixer and ribbon cutting ceremony for flow line for mr welsh over here um that was a that was a really neat event i, I kind of enjoyed myself there and i am done thank you all Thank you, sir. Mr. Scotty. Um, I, I, I also would like to thank Chief Smith for his service to not only Lemoore, but but the greater Kings County. Um, the fantastic job. Um, he says to get into law enforcement. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a great job for, for some people, but it, it takes a courageous human being to go and, and do what those men and women do on a daily basis that, that most of us i think take for granted so thank you and and your entire staff for 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 doing what they do for the city of lamore um yesterday i had the opportunity to go to the kings county economic development corporations uh, meeting uh, with city manager olson um, talked about some stuff um, they had their annual awards um, there was two places one from the city of lamore uh, rebecca's espresso and josh's roasting company received their uh, annual president's award. Um, if you don't know where they're at, they're over there by uh, Jack in the Box, Foster Freeze. Um, great, I did not realize that, that they supply, they're the only suppliers of coffee to Harris Ranch, which is kind of huge. Um, yes, sir. And then the partner award went to, uh, not necessarily the palace, but the Tachiokat tribe. So, um, you know, a couple places here in the Moor. So kudos to them. Um, on Thursday, October 10th, I said I was going to do a council with council. Uh, I still fully anticipate doing that. The location is going to be here. Um, we're going to get a flyer on the city webpage. I'm hoping to get with uh, Hanford Sentinel and possibly uh, Ed Martin to get it on his website. Um, that'll be here at 6 p.m., like I said, Thursday, October 10th. Um, I'll be providing waters and, and probably some coffee. Um, so please, that, that's open to everybody. I, I don't care if you're in, in my district or somebody else's district, or even if you live out on Lacey, you're, you're more than welcome to come. And and, and I'm not going to say I'm going to answer all your questions to the way you want them, but I, I'm more than happy to have dialogue with somebody. At what time was it? Uh, that is at 6 o'clock. Here. PM, right? <laughs> Affirmative. Um, yeah, no more than two canceled. Um, so speaking of meeting with people, I, I did meet with Miss Melody uh, Downey Dak uh, over at Starbucks, and, and we probably chit chatted outside of an ex student who kind of interrupted for a long time. But but we chit chatted for a while, and and, and I'm more than happy. Email me um, if you want my cell phone. I'm more than I don't know about more than happy, but I'm more than that willing to uh, to give it out to you. Uh, we are here for you guys. Um, thank you guys for showing up this evening. And oh, and I also got to throw kudos out to uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Day. And, and I don't know if you know who he is or not, but my daughter and I were um, we were shopping for some birthday presents for one of her buddies, and we went to the dollar store. And he's like, hey, you're on city council. Yeah, I'm on city council. And he's like, hey, I was reading through the uh, through the agenda packet, and there was an error. So I was kind of amazed that not only was he reading through it, because let's be honest, it's 100 and some odd pages, sometimes 300 pages. But this gentleman not only read through it, but he recognized an error and, and brought it to my attention. And I brought it to the attention of the city. So kudos to Michael Day. Awesome job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Willard. I have uh, a couple items. One, it deal, I sat in the uh, Kings County, uh, pu the uh, public transportation uh, 
agency meeting for David Brown. I gave him a briefing on uh, what was discussed. Uh, two items that were uh, talked about in uh, dealing with Lamar dealt with uh, Route 12 and Route 20. They both go from Hanford to elsewhere. But the, uh, the problem is the ridership and uh, they have to maintain a 10.75, I believe, percentage. Basically what they got is 15% of the box fee has to, you know, and then and the rest I, of it's I think matching. it's 10.75% yes, is what they're, they're dealing okay. with now. And so they, they're, they're not making their goal. And that was what the discussion was about. How do, we, how do they make their goal? And so uh, that those two items were continued and it'll probably happen at the next meeting when David goes there. So I thought I would go ahead and show you this multicolored route guide where people can go uh, in Kings County on cart. Kings area. Uh, was it rural transit? What yeah, it's, uh, if you go to www.cart.com com dot org or com uh, cart, cart gonna, bus dot org dot org they have all the routes there and everything uh, what they call it cart in kings county and yes, fresno right. county or what they call it a cat okay. or something like that <laughs> it's it's cat i think and then yeah Any, anyways i'm <laughs> i'm appealing to everybody to please tell your friends to get a get a book and and uh, wow. you know, if you know somebody that doesn't have a car, these are available, and uh, they can get them from the card office, the state, the station, probably. Yeah. And uh, or they can go online and get the same information. So uh, they are going to cut uh, stops in Lemoore if we don't get the ridership up. And so uh, when the bus gets to the main terminal, the last run has only got one or two people, and it's not economical to do it. And it impacts the uh, employment of drivers if they cut the stops. The second item I had was the uh, community swap meet. The last one of the season is on Saturday. So uh, if you want to take advantage of that, uh, you can talk about, uh, you can go there and enjoy uh, looking through what's on sale, or you can buy a space. That'll... Uh, That'll be on Saturday, the last one this year. And finally, I want to thank. Uh, where's that? So people what's that? Where's that? Where's it's that a, at the Veterans Park. Okay. Veterans Park uh, from 7 to 1 o'clock. And the last item, I have to thank Chief Smith. He's been uh, very, uh, been a very good chief over the last, what, seven years or so? Six, Six years, seems like seven. Seems like <laughs> but the time went by fast. And uh, and uh, I think the, the city's better off with a well-trained department like you have, and you have a, book, a very good staff. And uh, I think you've uh, trained everybody enough that you're not gonna be missed, but they'll miss you. All right. So uh, I want to thank you for your service and uh, good luck in the future. And uh, I, I wish I could say more, but I want to turn it over to the mayor. I don't have too much to say. Thank you, sir. Um, only thing I'm going to say is uh, I've been going to a grocery outlet. They had the ribbon cutting where Ms. me and Mr. Brown, Councilman Brown, went uh, last month or so, a month and a half ago. And um, I think we should do more advertisement for them. It's a phenomenal place. Uh, go in there and look, uh, get anything you want in there. I mean, it's, it's an awesome place, variety of things. Um, and then we got two Dollar Generals here as well. So we're moving along. I'm proud that seeing the city all work together as one, one unity. And um, the sad thing is, uh, I just heard the news today. Thank you, Mr. Bluer. Um Steve McQueen passed away. He was 99 years old. Hmm. And um, uh, he's been around for many years with the carpet laying down towel and all the above. And I want to give a shout out to his family. Um, it's, it's, I remember I was a little kid. It was funny back in the day, everybody used to drive around with the rifles in the back of their pickups and stuff like that. And uh, we used to get scared when we see him driving around, but he was a great guy. Uh, he helped a lot of people. This 
this young lady back here sitting back here, she was telling me about him, how she like how he laid her towel, did, did her carpet, but she didn't want pink, but he did it anyway. Uh, it was some great things and memories when you're seeing a lot of our older, our seniors are passing away. Uh, don't take them for granted. Go and reach out to them and touch them and tell them how much you care. Thank you for being the foundation to us. And that's all I have to say. And God bless the journey. Time is now 9.38. 9.38.